And hello, everyone. This is GVDS Presents. This is number 11. And with me today is the incomparable Ross Chapman, the experienced design consultant at, at Sprints out of London. He'll be with me for the next 60 minutes or so. And we're going to be talking about his work at Edge Sprints, um, some of his work with his latest podcasts and his thoughts about the industry. And probably Ross, we'll get a little bit into your impressions of the Design Sprint Conference that was hosted by Google back in Denver, Colorado, and some of your takeaways from that. Um, but for those who have never met Ross before, I'll give a brief introduction before he kind of goes in that direction. He is the product designer and head of Edge Sprints that says uh, that's within the Etch group. He helps product teams deliver change, adopt frameworks like the Design Sprint, helps them work together to improve the user experience of their businesses, and also address real customer problems. And over the past 10 years, he's uh, amassed a pretty impressive list of clients, Barclays, uh, WWF, the environmental group, not the wrestler group, I believe, <laughs> uh, Qu a Quilter, um, Basically, it's like you've helped a lot of clients with, with what they do. So from that, uh, why don't you go ahead and fill in the blanks for what I didn't get to and maybe touch upon some of the things that happened in uh, Boulder when we were out there. Yeah, totally. And thank you for that intro and this opportunity to hopefully add something uh, to to what what may have some voids, uh, like you said. So I, I've, I've been doing design for probably a good 10 years, maybe more. And uh, certainly in recent years, uh, I, my, my attraction to, to working uh, in sprints, on sprints, and, and using it as a tool uh, is just that it, it, it answered a lot of questions for me. And it told me how I can start solving problems. I didn't have to guess. I didn't have to kind of pick an activity because I thought that might work. The, the sprint really said, hey, this is a formula, try it, see if you like it. And I did like it. And I've been using it for the last two years now on a variety of mainly digital uh, products. And every time we get to somewhere where I don't think many people thought we would. So for, for me, I, I love this, this way of working, this framework. It gives me confidence when I'm using kind of bold ideas and trying to get people to do their best work, which is one of my kind of reasons for being. And and yeah, running running the team of Etch Sprints, uh, we've just passed our first birthday. So I've been running it commercially on my own uh, for one year now. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it actually came about at the Google SprintCon, which is a wonderful segue um, to go in. So yeah, I, I started that that team and mission a year ago in San Francisco for, for the last Sprint Conference. And uh, and this year, kind of look back on that. And uh, and the conference this year was great. Uh, I, I heard differing opinions from people. Uh, some thought that there was this unease that people aren't contributing to the community uh, as much as everyone should be. Um, and there was also other good stuff as well. I listened very carefully about what Google was saying and a number of other conversations where people are, are now starting to gain traction. I think last year, uh, the conversation was more, how do you start running sprints? How maybe could you do more than one? And, and start implementing. I think this year was more about the human uh, within the, the framework. I agree. Uh, the, the case studies, the, uh, I, I was most interested talking to people about how they had used sprints in ways that I'm not using yet and I'd love to use. So in the case of uh, change management in, in product strategy, in, in even the realm of, of business management, uh, those are, are stories that I was just so interested to hear because that's those are some of the flavors that I'd like to kind of investigate. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting uh, conference from my point of view. What's I don't go to actually any other conference other than this one uh, because every time I go and I've only been twice, I get something out of it that I hadn't thought I would. This time I got 
inspiration, uh, some really interesting ideas. My notebook was just thick of, of ideas to try out. And I had fun. And why shouldn't you do things that, that make you enjoy who you're with, what you're doing and uh, where you're at? So yeah, for me, it was a great conference. Um, I ran two workshops, one with you, uh, in, in actual fact, with Mural. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I got a lot from it. Yeah, from what I heard from other people that were part of your your group, I think you were on the right hand side, and Jay Jay Maloney was on the left. Yeah. Um, Though I I actually went around and did a little bit of recon uh, towards the end, and I asked people what they thought of each session, both Jay's and yours, because I knew that mine was subpar, and people were just kind of <laughs> they were at, heading for the exits even before I got the chance to. You know, take that the, is not true. Oh, it is absolutely. You should have seen it. Like some people just like threw their their Google uh, pamphlet and they threw it against the wall, and scattered <laughs> food in the lobby. I mean, it was. It, I can I'm not going to name the person, but he's a uh, he's uh, trolling me right now on LinkedIn. It's it's terrible. Uh -huh. um, anyway, what I did, I actually did talk to some of the people that were part of your session, and um, the the words I heard were that it was they, the thing I the thing I heard a couple, from a couple people say is they made meaningful connections, meaning that they really felt that they uh, they connected with your material, they, they, with your approach. Um, and it, it kind of leads me to a question I have about the way you work with people. Mm -hmm. Are you the kind of person that that really inherently listens to conversations and really takes in um, different data points and different perspectives to kind of give a summary or a feel for where things are? I mean, how do you how do you tend to interact with other human beings in relation to design sprints, especially maybe using the example of the um, the uh, presentation that you did with Mural? Yeah, sure, that's that's a great question to kick off. So I, I always try and synthesize things in my language first. I need to understand it first. So even, even reading um, Jake, John and Braden's book to start with, uh, you know, a couple of years ago now, I, I read it and then had to understand it. And even my first one was kind of a, a design sprint light. I wasn't able to understand why we were doing these activities and doing them in a certain way. And I wanted to get a better feeling of what does this mean when I do it? And I, I need to be so in tune with the material, especially when I'm doing something new, that I always have to synthesize it in my voice. And, and probably some of that feedback that you heard and, and why maybe that, that feedback happens is that I'm, I'm not a lover of, of jargon. I don't like excluding people out of a conversation. Hmm. So I always try and use very simple language or, or simple as I can language uh to to include people uh because i i don't think i just i just think that's a bit of a douche move uh so trying to to encourage people and i'm interested in people i i want to know why they're here why did you sit there and and take part in this and i'm i'm naturally inquisitive and that's what i think makes me a good designer because i i'm always asking why i'm always trying to find out what, what's the real problem and where, where's the root of, of this, this initial kind of challenge? And I don't want to spend my time on useless stuff or, or stuff that, that doesn't move anyone forward. Or, uh, you know, I will often uh, say no to meetings because I get nothing from it or don't think I can add value to it. Uh, and and those, those kind of actions that I've seen in, in my history, I'm... I'm certainly in the last few years more aware on how I spend my time, who I'm helping. And yeah, even you know, in the last couple of years, I'm really enjoying all of that. I, I really enjoy the contribution that I'm making, the, the things that I'm taking. And I, I honestly love what I'm doing, which I think is kind of rare sometimes. I don't think some people have found their purpose or their passion. They're still searching around for it. And I've only found it in the last few years. So two comments. One is that I've heard this as a theme. This is starting to come up over and over again about how practitioners like yourself and Bill Alexi is another that comes to mind. Um, I think a few more do it, Rakesh Castorio as well. 
where they use common language to try to um, communicate effectively with other people that don't know, say, the design sprint discipline, mm -hmm. or tries to use language in, in conversations so that the emphasis is on understanding, uh, being able to make sure that the other person can not only take in what you're saying, but be able to reflect it in a way that you feel like you've already been understood, like as a mm. foundation. And especially with the design sprint process, with all with its nomenclature, with its um, even with what we just came out of with the lightning decision jam, I think it was Frizzo Jankowski from uh, uh, Atos who basically rephrased it as a 90 minute decision making meeting, where that was much more palpable for leadership because that all of those words made sense when they're all brought together. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's something that I'm finding that practitioners in the field and people in this business are kind of kind of aligning to. The other comment is that I'm seeing this kind of interpretation of the design sprint process in mass. Like it is, it, it was one of those things that was just there in relation to your point about last year, the design sprint conference was about, uh, you know, connecting. And now there's this, this feeling that it's kind of grown out of that. And now it's more about people kind of using the process in a way that that's intuitive to them. But that's where I find that the real innovation starts coming into play. Micah Copens, who we just got done talking with, is, is exploring voice sprints. Uh, Rakesh Kasturi and Matt Stewart, who I mentioned before, they're doing uh, life sprints and they're, they're making a real effort towards that. Uh, Sabrina Gorich, who we both know, and Jerome from Rao, they're, uh, they're, they're interpreting the design sprint process and, and incorporating it with hiring and doing you know, talent sprints mm -hmm. and making it an alternative to where they can go. And to me, it's, it's exciting because now you're, you're starting to get into the venture of, okay, you're still using the word sprint, but you're, now you're combining this, this process with something else and making it different, which is what McKinsey had done, what, which other companies had done, but now it's happening on the level that we're used to, what we're seeing. And it's just really interesting to see where it goes. Uh, it, may, it may lend credence to other things where it kind of more like with voice and AI and other, and other um, uh, kind of technologies and how that blends. But yeah, I, I thought this year's Design Sprint Conference was more about discovering how people were taking the process and, and doing new things with it and, and exploring mm -hmm. where it could go. Yeah, on, on those those points the, the yeah it's it's about the language that you, we use and, and Kim's completely right some the the words design sprint and other things can be a gift and a curse so it can be a gift because people are, are looking to that they they've read about it they they want to know more it can be a curse because certainly in, in the business world design that's for designers so that's not our our thing uh, sprints isn't that something that developers do um okay so it's a design to de develop a thing uh it's nothing to do with how we run and serve customers and, and 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 kind of make this business work but it is fundamentally that we're just doing it through the the, the tool of design so yeah i'm i'm often a b testing language and mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll say problem so, uh, solving, or I'll say um, we're, I, I often am trying now not to actually say the words just because I don't want people to feel like it's, it's a speed bump to getting things done. Like any other project, you know, back five, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have to explain the approach before you get, got started, but actually it needed some approach and that's what's great about Sprint. We, we, because we're all fans of it, we, we often spend a little bit of time feeling like we have to um, be ambassadors and evangelize, but actually uh, that can sometimes exclude or turn people off or, or that kind of thing. So I, like I say, I think it's a gift and a curse, certainly in, in the first year, uh, first financial year of Vet Sprints, it's a gift because pretty much 100% of the people that came to Edge Sprints wanted a design sprint, wanted someone to run it for them. Certainly in our next year and, and forward, I'll be playing around with that because my fundamental feeling is that 90% of projects 
should be starting with a design sprint or there is a program of work where there should be a design sprint and people aren't aware of it or they don't feel like they, they should or the, 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 the weight of this, this thing is so much that they're just going to have to see it through and just stare into their computers and hope that it all ends sometime. So, I, yeah, I think it's a gift and a curse. I, I kind of like it because it's if you're part of the dialogue about how we converse about this method or about the methodology or how people consume it or how it's interpreted. I think it's an important voice to have because a lot of a lot of times you can get lost in the process kind of like, I mean, think of agile or think of UX and how <clears throat> people who are advocates of those will be immersed in the language and immersed in the process, but forget there's a bigger picture involved with what they do. Um, one of the most brilliant uh, pre presentations I've seen in recent memory has been uh, Paul Adams's uh, The End of Naval Gazing, where it was pretty much a treatise on UX, saying like, look guys, you have to got to get out of the research and design phase and understand our research and design emphasis and uh, understand that there's people that touch your customers and use and conversate with your users much more than you do. Mm -hmm. Sales, customer service, marketing, strategy, they all have different dimensions to how the business runs, but you kind of have to have a, a much grander view than just the production line that they're normally used to, say with UX. Um, and I, I don't sense that the, that the design sprint community is in danger of doing that yet. It has, it has the makings of what the Usability Professionals Association used to be, where they thought they had the magic sauce and all you had to do is listen to the user to get the, the you know, the, to align the business the right way. Mm. But that's why I think you, that's why I'm emphasizing that I think your approach to language being a blessing and a curse. I kind of think that that as long as you swim in that pool a bit and make people aware that it really is about communication, that's an important conversation to have and for people to really consider when they're talking with clients, talking with peers, learning more about what they want to do, being more self-aware about the, what their strengths are. Um, I think that's something that that I would encourage you, at least for me, to kind of have more of that as being part of the conversation that you come forward with, because it may be it may be endearing. Say the design sprint process runs its course, runs its course, and then there's something else that comes into play. That conversational tone or that approach to conversations will still persist because it's part of the human condition. Um, so at least that's my two cents. Yeah, yeah, I, I think. It's certainly in my realm. It's about listening to your customers, and I don't want to be talking a, an alien language that they don't understand. They find no value in, and essentially they go elsewhere. Uh, so that's yeah. I, th I think language and communication is just sometimes underrated, especially with new business owners or or new freelancers or professionals. They they, they think that once they start, people will just be, you know, ringing them, phone off the hook, you know, people going around the, the side of their block, like waiting to knock on the door. And it's not the case. You, you still have to listen to your customers, solve their problems and, and ask them what they need help with. You and relate just, to them. As yeah, human exactly. And, yeah. and that's why I'm so keen on this plain language thing, because then some people use it as a kind of oh I know more than you so you should buy from me and I I don't like that I I think mm -hmm. that's snooty I think if you and Bill Alexi ever had the chance to partner together on something you two would be dynamic um I I hear his name a few times I, I've never met him but yeah I I hear him now and again I have a recording from a GVS GVDS presents he was actually my first one um cool. and just start and, strong and, and then towards the end get people like me on there <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I compare it to like a drag race. So if nothing else, we, we, we made a lot of noise, a lot of tire turning, a lot of yeah. smoke, full of momentum. And that was, that was perfect for Bill. And now we're, we're, like, we're like going a million miles an hour at this point, and we're just waiting yeah. to parachute. And I, think, I don't know who I'm going to make that alignment with at the end of the month, but we'll see. Maybe it's yeah. Seth. I have no, no idea. That's good. We, we, no one has it all figured out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like to touch upon what you had mentioned about your one year anniversary at Etch. Uh, I remember a while back that you said you were working with interns as part of, uh, as part of your group. Yeah. And it made me think about servant leadership and uh, some of the things I see with kind of people management. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to know from your perspective is uh, 
what kind of leader are you in that regard? How do you approach like kind of um, uh, the people that you work with at Etch and what has the experience been like with working with your interns? Okay, uh, let's, let's hit off some, some quick ones. So to explain uh, my, my business work, I need to explain Etch. Uh, Etch Group is a group of small teams. We believe small teams make a big difference. Uh, we've got five teams. Uh, Etch Sprints is one of those teams. And if you liken it to maybe Spotify squads or uh, Airbnb's model where they have a team around a customer, whether it's the host or the, um, or the guest, that's, that's how you can, can understand that. So there, there are other teams within Etch that have interns. I do not. Um, I, I'm pretty much still on my own. Uh, certainly the second year I'm looking to scale up. I'm doing it very carefully, probably a bit too carefully. And, um, and so I can't speak about how I might work with manage or, uh, mentor interns. I on mentorship, and I know it wasn't your specific question. I do spend a lot of time meeting people up having no expectation. Uh, sometimes they're asking me for advice or um, maybe they want a job or whatever. And I just, I just know I need to meet people, have conversations. Uh, I was taught quite early on by uh, Tom RMD, have, have a thousand conversations and just be in that, that zone of just talking to people. Because when you talk and have a discussion and communicate, you're learning. You're, you're all the way through, you, your assumptions are being tested. You might learn something new about their background or what they do. And I get tremendous value out of that. It, it doesn't work for, for my business needs at all. I just do it like I do marketing, like I do uh, things like this. I expect nothing in return. I just know that you must do it. Uh, in terms of what leader I am, again, I don't have a team right now. Uh, so I, uh, I say borrow, um, I borrow designers when I need them. I work with other people within the group when that seems to make sense. If we're doing a strategy piece, if we're doing uh, a piece of user research, um, that makes more sense. But certainly in my second year, I'm looking to scale. There, there's a reason it's not called Ross Chapman Sprints because I never want it to be just me. I, I want a cool little team having fun, doing the best work of our lives. And the, <laughs> we spend most of our time doing work. So make it purposeful. Uh, I, I hear so many conversations about what about our culture? How do we ensure people have fun? Do we do away days or, or do we do this, that and the other? No, people should have fun during work. That's, that's where the effort is. That's where they get uh, enriched and engaged. There was a, a statistic last week saying, was it 85% of people at work are disengaged? Like that, that, to me, that feels like a problem that I want to help contribute to solve because that's where we're spending most of our lives. And yeah, we got to turn that. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. In terms of what leader I am, time will tell. <laughs> Well, yeah, it was a it was a misstep on my part, so that's uh, it was a good recovery. But maybe... No, that's great. I, I I need to I need to explain more about this this unique setup that I have here. I, I, people ask me why are you doing this with an etch? Um, why don't you just create your own studio or or just be a facilitator like Xander Pollock or whatever? I actually thrive on people around me, supporting me, pushing me, uh, and and I actually enjoy company. Uh, if, if I was to do this on my own, I would have to turn back the clock 10 years. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to talk to some of the client relations that we have. Uh, it would be a very different story and probably one that I'd not be too engaged in. So that's, that's why I love doing what I do at Etch and uh, thankfully they let me do what I wanna to do too. <laughs> no, I, I can liken it to um, John Coltrane, who did his tutorship under Miles Davis. Right. That, yes, you've talked about this before. I, yeah. Yeah, basically, it's just a matter, you're, you're kind of in the band. And eventually, if you, if you decide to kind of break out with your solo, then you will at some point. 
But in the meantime, you're you're solid in terms of like the orchestraic aspect that is etch and yeah. what you're doing there. So for the time being, there's not really an, uh, an argument either way. Um, maybe a, a interesting question to ask would be, if you were to partner with someone that it, on, a, on a project or an endeavor or something else, something somebody you feel would complement your own strengths very well, like maybe do things that, that normally aren't inherently intuitive for you, uh, what kind of person would that be? And is there somebody like that in the world that you already know of where you'd like to kind of say, you know what, there was, there was an opportunity I would love to work with X. Mm, that's a really interesting question. I, I've probably got a few answers to this. I am. Um, Let's say you can I'm, make your own, uh, sorry, Ross, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Let's say you can make your own band. Let's say it's more than one person. That can <laughs> basically like supplement. So you, you can basically get it up to like three or four people, but go for it. Who would, who would you want to be part of your quote unquote band or the group that you'd like to work together on? Oh, wow. Uh, I, I will, I'll try and answer in, in types of people rather than names. Cause then they'll, they'll just be like, why didn't you include me, Ross? Um, <laughs> I, I yeah, no question. Don't include me by default. I, I you know, <laughs> I, I want, I want other people. I'd like to hear what that. Is. So, so to unpick your question, I, I don't often want to work with people that compliment me because that just seems like the safe game. I, I want to work with people that might be very different, offer a different point of view. Usually, they're better than me as well. Like, uh, who is it that says you should always hire better than yourself? Um, so, someone clever. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in a few spaces right now. I'm interested in uh, the world of business consultancy and management because I feel like we have a, a solution to some of that. Um, so one of that team band member would be someone from that world. I'm unlikely to do an MBA but I'd love to learn that language. So I would pair up with them and kind of um, understand that world a bit more. Uh, I would, I, I, th I think the work that we do uh, can be used in, in other contexts. Um, certainly strategy, people buy it. They don't know what it is. They need an expert to tell them how to do it. Uh, so some kind of strategy lead that, that knows strategy inside and out. And then probably my last one would be, I, research is important, but it's not on my radar. For some reason, I, I like the impetus of a sprint where you just get on and go, you, you execute, you, you base your work on assumptions that, and at the end of the week, you're gonna be proved right or wrong. Uh, but I know the usefulness of research as a long form thing. Um, so someone that loves that, um, and if I could add someone to kind of move around the drum kit, <laughs> it would be, uh, certainly someone that loves visual design. I, I kind of push my way away from that, uh, probably a year ago. I'm not best qualified to do it anymore. Um, most of my stuff just didn't, didn't, I, I see great examples of it. And I'm saying, if you love that, you do it and, and bring your game. Um, I can critique to an extent, but yeah, that's probably, that's probably a jazz band in, in answer to your question, uh, you know, slow and steady, but kind of wacky, uh, backstories. Uh, we do have somebody in the global virtual design sprint. His name is Mateo and he's a hell of a drummer. He's actually in a metal band. So if you need that along Amazing. with what I decided, I've got somebody for you already. Cool. Cool. There you go. <laughs> um, so for those of you in Zoom, as well as on YouTube, if you'd like to ask Ross some questions, we're going to start rolling those in because they've been coming in uh, in Zoom. And I know that in YouTube, they're going to be doing the same. So right. uh, we'll get right into it. We'll start with uh, Kim McCartan, who I want to look her up really fast because I, she's in the Global Virtual Design Sprint, but she mm. also has a pretty impressive background. She is someone who is a multimedia designer, writer, and design sprint facilitator. Mm -hmm. She's been running her own business for over 15 years. And uh, her question, and I'm going to task with real fast is, do you have different design sprint formats for different clients and industries, like a five day, a four day, or other type of engagement? Uh, Kim, that is a really interesting question, especially right now. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm, 
Okay, the answer to this right now is no. Uh, I've just been running a four day format uh, 45 times now uh, over the last one and a half years. What I've learned recently, uh, certainly the, the Google Spring Conference has, has helped in that regard, is that I, I'm always looking to reinvent myself, a bit like Madonna, I guess. Um, and I think there's a better flavor for that. I really like what Google have done with the design sprint recently. It feels a lot more kind of honed and uh, it includes some of that kind of business model canvas and strategy and adds a bit more rigor to the whole framework. And I'm kind of interested in that right now. In terms of creating or using different flavors, um, it's, it's a term that I know some people say, uh, there's a different flavor of sprint here than the other. I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit shy of doing that for a couple of reasons. I certainly don't want to invent my own sprint right now. I, I don't have a problem to solve there. there. There's a few good frameworks out there. I would just rather just pick them up and my story will be how I've applied that in a different situation or, or a different problem or a different industry. Uh, I'm more of the opinion right now in October 2019 that I would rather have the design sprints with different use cases. I, I don't, I'm not keen right now and hopefully I don't change my mind uh, of creating the uh, strategy sprint and the um, innovation sprint and the, um, I don't know, like that kind of thing. I know other people do and I totally understand why. I would rather, and this is what I like about the sprint, I would rather have a framework and then I fill it with something different. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about that framework being the same all the way through is after another year, I might find some improvements. I might find a few different recipes to supercharge it. Um, that's what I like. When you have a constant, because I love systems, if you have a constant system and you do it enough times, then you can improve it. And I'm worried that if I create four different flavors with four different tracks, then I have four things to update and keep on top of and have different reps of. So hopefully that answers your question. So right now I run the Design Sprint 2.0 framework um, and in the next few weeks I'm going to probably change that interesting okay great <laughs> <laughs> well now I'm gonna have to keep glued onto your podcast on your articles and figure out uh, all those generating right. leads and yeah it's if great. I had an f5 key on my MacBook Pro if it actually came up on my little thing I probably would press it on the, on the times I'm either sipping tea and waiting for an update from a from Ross Chapman, but until then, I, I yeah, I, I've been told I need to do more YouTube. My YouTube success so far has been pretty abysmal, so I do need to just have more reps of making videos. There we go. Well, let me let me ask you really quick. What feels really more natural and, and less friction for you between uh, YouTube, the podcast, and writing an article? What what seems to be the the easiest for you to do in terms of like an extension of what you naturally like to do? Or is it uh, yeah, so the answer isn't in those options. So right now, Instagram stories are still where my heart's at. And the whole reason I started on there was to act as a rehearsal for YouTube. If you look at my kind of CV, I actually started as a videographer. So YouTube is like this hallowed ground that only top grade quality stuff is available to go because it's evergreen. It's always there. Mm -hmm. So I've always been super tentative about doing something on there. Uh, but that's really where I need to go because that's where people are learning from. It's, it's the second most destinated place for finding stuff. Um, articles I do now and again, uh, they, they often often work. Podcasts, the strongest ones are when I'm interviewing someone I really want to learn from. And the whole reason I started the, the podcasting was I wanted to capture the conversations that I was having with people that I really respected and wanted to learn from. Uh, and 
that was just a way to share it but actually it sometimes was a bit of a vehicle to get that conversation <laughs> so it was really useful in that way um and the other option of what was the other one um yeah other media is is a bit trickier i haven't done much on twitter in the last few years i just yeah it, it's it's a bit of a hard one to crack um what about, what about TikTok? I have TikTok. That is there. I've done a couple of videos. Um, Steph Cruchon is all over it, and I'm late to the party. Essentially, um, my daughter is showing me how to use TikTok. No, I'm not. I'm not that <laughs> that bad. Um, yeah, I I often find TikTok and certainly Instagram to be that kind of behind the scenes stuff, whereas YouTube is probably the front and center of mm. of that world. Like when the cameras stop rolling, I'm on Instagram and TikTok. But when the cameras roll, I'm probably on YouTube. That, that's and video is a bit more authentic to me uh articles i'm not a gifted writer if you want that go to my wife she's got a published book out now uh <laughs> she's actually doing really well and um yeah that that's where her skills are so yeah. video seems to be where i'm at because i'm the most authentic self I am really fast i'm i'm this close to basically just using tiktok as like a document um uh, just even if I'm not interested in it, I'm just going to go, okay, just got done with Ross. Now I'm, yeah. this, is a, this is my setup. Now I'm gone. 15 seconds of like, like just insights into the boring, dull like background stuff that I'm always constantly used to. But mm. 800 million users can't be wrong. And they're going to get sick of people basically dancing to tunes every so often. So something, something will, it's a, it's a grand experiment in what people may uh, kind of find themselves attracted to or look at. So might as well see where it goes. It, it's it's a video platform, and it's it's Vine two point oh is what yeah it is. yeah exactly. And why Twitter killed Vine? Like even my daughter says, oh here's here's a, a playlist of clean vines to to watch on YouTube, and we're just like, why why did that disappear? That that seemed really weird. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I I think I want to know where you drive to in your Tesla. I want to know, um, you know, what happens when when Robert is is off screen um probably not everything but maybe a bit more than I'm. it saying. will it will could take your entire impression of me crashing down to earth in such <laughs> a way so that you'll you'll wonder why you even engaged me in the first place so i can be self facing too i can basically like you know dig the grave i want to sleep in yes i will just keep on telling everyone how bad i am there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's it is, easy uh... to do because it's 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 the least offensive way of kind of uh being creative i guess it's easier to make fun of yourself definitely you live with yourself all your life. I mean, I'm I'm turning. Uh, so fair disclosure, I'm turning fifty in January. 50. Whoa! What the hell am I doing being fifty in January? <laughs> I mean, I should I should at least have like uh, you know two parts of my body that aren't working anymore. I should be on like heavy meds. I should have like fourteen marriages. I mean, I should have like a life that's completely different <laughs> from what I have now. But yeah. it's, it's just it's just totally. But now it's like I'm in a great place where I'm. Anyway, I'm going off. I'll stop. I'm, I'm... The the most important organ to me is I don't know if it's an organ actually, but the brain. The the br like when the brain goes, then to me that's that's game over. Um, yeah, anything to feed this thing. Yeah, yeah, and keep it healthy. Yeah, so, good, good. We're on the same page. Brains are yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the incomparable Sandy Lamb, who is yeah, he's a she is. Certified design for a sprinter, a product designer, and a design system designer as well. She Amazing. is the person that is my uh, partner in crime. She's making literally all the templates for the GVDS. And somebody I believe in is going to be a monster in a few years. She, totally. basically, she basically asks the question, what is the best term you find so far from your A-B testing to call design sprint in front of a business owner? Yeah, that's a great question, Sandy. Uh, and I saw you in action earlier, and that was awesome. So thank you for, for letting me um, be a part of that. I, yeah, I'm, I, sometimes it's just not addressing it at all. Uh, when you're running a sprint, you're, you're kind of explaining the instructions. Uh, sometimes I send a video or something just to explain what, what things look like in, in my own way. Uh, but yeah, terms I use, uh, sometimes it's a design project and this just happens to be the way that we start doing it. 
sometimes, uh, you know, product strategy. Uh, just, just I, I'm still testing, essentially. I'm still testing. And it depends the, of the maturity of the company. Uh, one I did, I worked on recently, they were looking for a marketing campaign. So they, they, they were saying, well, how do we do this? And uh, we ran a sprint and we actually ended up not with a marketing campaign, but with a digital product that kind of solved their challenges, but I'm always extracting the solution from the problem. Mm. They'll, they'll come saying, we need a marketing campaign. That's, that's a solution. That, that's not the problem we're solving. So I'm still testing it, Sandy. I, I, I think it's, yeah, I, I, I don't think I've found it yet. Um, and it depends which market. If you're using kind of small uh, to medium, you'd call it a, a web or digital project and you're um, collaborating and, and solving the problem. And, and more often you're describing the, the benefits rather than giving it a name. Uh, so this will get us, this will de-risk the project. Uh, so we're gonna do this thing. Um, yes, it takes two or three days, uh, but we need focus to work. Uh, and it's gonna be different to what you've done before. Um, but trust us, we've done this a number of times and we've done it with these people and we got to further outcomes. So, yeah, I, I try and not give it a word or a few words that people might not resonate with. I just try and explain around it right now, but I'm still A-B testing. And as a follow-up, Sandy asks, do you feel different cultures may prefer certain terms better? Yeah, I think, so. or, or, or countries or, um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I do, I agree. <laughs> have I have them all mapped out yet? No, and I'm not trying to, you know, serve the whole of the globe. Um, but yeah, certainly, uh, I'm getting a bit more experience with the US. And I, I know from from talking to other people, using the words design sprints in Silicon Valley, uh, can often kind of not resonate. Uh, for some reason, it, it's kind of like a uh, a thing that's opposite to itself for some reason. Um, so yeah, uh, but again, sometimes it's a draw. Some people ask for it, so you do it. Um, but where I'm interested, certainly in the next year, is finding those projects or programs of work that are happening and adding my two cents in the form of a, a design sprint. Interesting. I, I sometimes think that the term workshop is starting to become a dirty word, that people are trying to take workshop with that's historically with uh, huge amounts of time that are put into something without a clear uh, like deliverable or outcome or way forward, unless you basically uh, have the right people in the room. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wonder sometimes using the words problem solving might, might be difficult for some. They just see things as a project. They, they were just told to deliver this project. Uh, what problems are we solving? I don't know. I'm going to have to ask the the project sponsor or, or something. So yeah, I do, I do think that there are probably different pieces of language, different terms, um, and you just need to learn the language of your customer. So following up uh, from a question that Micah Copens, the kind of the inventor of the voice prints had mm. in our last uh, session, um, what makes you happy? Oh, what makes me happy? I, I love the achievement of getting, helping a team or a group of people achieving something, certainly in, in work, that, that's in a work context, getting them to somewhere that they didn't even think about to start with. Uh, what makes me happy is <laughs> sometimes giggling how much fun I'm having in work and <laughs> on I think people around the office that because if you're just if you're just walking around giggling all day that'd be like all right that's Ross <laughs> yeah yeah that's what I think other people like in in these buildings think they they think Ross is starting to go insane because I'm not the 85 percent and uh because I genuinely like I I've I've just found a few truths that I align with like whenever you have a choice, often the answer is both. Uh, whenever you're, you're asked about something and you don't understand it, I will say, 
I don't understand. And I'll just kind of live my truth a bit. So um, that's why I have these kind of manic giggles because I, I really am enjoying what I'm doing. Uh, what what I, I do enjoy outside of work uh, is spending time with my family. I've got two children uh, and a wife and I really, I really enjoy doing things together. Weekends in my household looks very, very strange. You, you think of me as someone that's always on it, that's working a lot, that's doing a lot of marketing, and I do all that Monday to Friday. On Saturday and Sunday, I am flat. I, I am walking around in my slippers. I, I am just sitting around. I might watch a film. I might go out with my children. Uh, I might go out for a bike ride. Uh, Sunday, I make, certainly in this season, I make a, a apple or a pear and chocolate crumble. Um, things slow down so much at the weekends and I need that flow. Otherwise, I, I burn out. Uh, so those are the things that make me happy. Finding purpose at work, uh, making things that weren't possible, possible. Um, encouraging courage, like, like was the running theme at the spring conference. Uh, and, and some of those things that I enjoy outside of work. And some, actually sometimes I, I enjoy things that aren't enjoyable, but they remind me to keep going and to keep focused and to keep, keep moving on. Mm. So it's, it's a bit, yeah, cue the manic laughs. <laughs> Well, as long as you're giggling, then I won't worry about you. But if you if I if I time at eight minutes on a giggle at some point, I'm just gonna be like, all right, are, are you okay, yeah. Ross? Everything all right? Bring should I should, I should I use Amazon or some service to order some fish and chips and bring it over to Ed <laughs> so that you could have you could have some and, and then I'll I'll have them ship over like a, a pair of your favorite slippers. So you can wow. rock around the slippers, have the fish and chips, inquire with different people and actually see what they're doing and yeah. Put you back the, on the the slippers is a funny one. No one ever asked me this because they probably don't see the, the bottom half of me. Uh, I, I saw when uh, Jake Knapp came over to promote uh, Make Time and he did a workshop over in London. Uh, for, for the sessions that he's in, indoors, he wears slippers. Mm -hmm. uh, he wears um, some really nice ones that I forget the name of. And I was like, I need those slippers. And, and I bought myself some slippers and then <laughs> people are like why are you walking around the office in these slippers and i'm like well you know i was inspired and actually it makes a lot of sense we we wear outdoor shoes outdoors we should wear something else indoors and you know feet with socks just isn't enough but people don't really agree with me there um so yeah. <laughs> that's well, that's it, why i say yeah, slippers yeah, it's like tribes they want you to kind of align to the cultural standards that you're used to in there so anything yeah. Anything outside of that is like a, it's like a, it's something that they have to kind of process. So to speak. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So by the I, way, yeah. um, Kim has a couple of follow-up questions, and one of them I can't mm. believe we haven't talked about in the hour that we've had. One of them is, do you do you do any virtual sprints? And yeah, a big big time advocate for remote sprints, and here we are just saying we're having some great conversation, but it's like. It's one topic we didn't touch on. And she also talked about the biggest client success from a sprint that you're proud of. Okay. Oh, that, that's, that's a really good one. Yeah, I'll start with that one. Um, the biggest client success. I, I, the, the sprint is, is quite a strange concept for, for anyone that, that hasn't done it. It is exhausting. You're asked stuff that you have to kind of, give assumptions and normally in, in work, you have meetings, you call that collaboration, but it's not actually collaboration. You're, you're, you're kind of sharing what you were told to do and then you're assigned homework and then you go off individually and do it and prepare for the next meeting. So certainly I've been in some jobs where the sole focus of someone's work was creating stuff for a meeting, which doesn't make sense at all. Uh, so the, the, the success that I find is just people feeling like they've, they've moved mountains and uh, figuratively, obviously, um, and they get in, enjoyment out of it. And <laughs> sometimes some of the clients that I work with are kind of like, oh, is, is that like, this was really fun. Like this was probably the most 
fun and purposeful time I've had in my current job. Um, are you hiring at all? And like, the, those are the kind of things that I get out of a, a sprint, which to me gives me feedback that it works and uh, we've done something. And if anything, the challenge for, for me and next sprints over the next year is to actually build on that momentum. Normally at the end of a sprint, I say, great, we've achieved it. Uh, we've, we've done some user testing on this high quality prototype. You've got a roadmap, you know how to build your MVP. Off, off you go, good luck. Um, if you need ideas for suppliers, here, here's some. Next year, well, this year and next, I'm gonna build upon that momentum because often the first sprint isn't enough. Uh, you need a bit, a few more reps and certainly in agency land, ending with a failure is quite hard <laughs> um, when you're building reputation and um, you're, you're helping solve client problems. So uh, I'm hoping to build upon that success and have even more client successes. Uh, in terms of virtual sprint, it's, it's again, an interesting time, um, very similar to the, you know, what type of sprints do you do? Uh, we're, we're running the remote sprint chapter that Google are supporting. Uh, they're doing a kind of pilot program and we're going to be running a lot of uh, meetups to kind of help people get to the stage where they can do what they do in person online. Mm -hmm. That is where a lot of my efforts going uh, because the, the, the remote sprints that I have been talking to companies with and uh, encouraging them that this is actually a better way to use your budget, to use your time, to use your people, has often been met with barriers uh, being, we work in an open plan office. Uh, we can't get everyone's timelines arranged. Um, people actually are finding it hard using a computer and, and you throw them something like Mural and they go, whoa, this is magic, but I need a few weeks to acclimatize. So if anything, I'm doing a lot of the pre-work to get this kind of education and established base to then say, now let's, let's power up and, and use the power of the sprint in a remote context. Mm -hmm. So in terms of have I done any virtual sprints, I've done two. Uh, one was actually in my personal time because I wanted to get skilled up to understand it so I can start doing it commercially. Um, and really it's, if anyone's doing in-person sprints, it is pretty much completely different. Uh, some things will be very similar. And Robert, you know way more, you've done way more reps than I. So I'm not going to, you know, speak to uh, or preach. Um, but the answer to this is I am educating and teaching people that they can do this. They just need to have courage. They just need to... Um, get more remote enabled. That's why I like a bit more of Jason Freed's content recently, because Basecamp is kind of a more remote operation, even though they have their headquarters in Chicago. But he's doing a lot of Q&A on Twitter at the moment. And he's talking about, um, uh, and Mark Tippin yesterday was talking about sizes and shapes of teams. That's the space that I'm both being a student of, and also kind of sharing and demystifying and a lot of the content of my webinars is on that subject. Um, so it is a growth area for me. That's where I can add a bit of value, um, ho hopefully a bit more than just a bit. And um, everyone kind of knows it's the future. I, Robert, I'm sure you agree. Like everyone kind of knows this is where it's all headed, mm -hmm. but you need a few people to or, or process or, or news or something to start building the stepping stones to get there and certainly the language that i speak to with with clients and, and management and things like that because they don't understand it it's hard to approve it and i that's that's where a lot of my effort is going at the moment i hope that answers that question in a very long-winded and unspecific way it was a very nuanced and intelligent answer. Now you're going to hear <laughs> my my point of view, which is more uh, blasé and very uh, verbose, also, but it's a synced. Um, 
we're, we're both on the same page and I would be preaching to you in that I told you I, I, a year and a half ago that this is where it was going. I, mm -hmm. I, after just doing it for a year, I just kind of saw the, 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 the evolution of where this is all going and where people are taking things from remote work to kind of frictionless kind of environments where you could get things done. And I just thought, all right, if, if I really want to put my, my, my chips down on something and say, I want to be historically correct about something, this is it. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the hesitation around virtual sprints that I hear from clients is, echoes a lot of what you do. We're not ready. We have cognitive gaps. We have, uh, we have technical issues and everything else. I get all that, but I've heard it before. And where I heard it before was UXers talking about design sprints. That's where I knew design sprints were going to actually take off and actually be part of the entire conversation when it came to producing new products and services. And I heard the, bat, the, the, the re resistance originally from UX from leaders, from people in the industry that had been around 15, 20 years, people that, that still have their UCD posters up on the wall saying, this is the way to go is user-centered design, which people still to this day kind of hold as the holy grail of kind of making good work. But I don't have romantic notions about things. I look at the market and I look at the demands of what people are asking for. And I look at it from a generational standpoint too. The generations that are coming up behind us that are gonna be starting to come into the workforce have been saturated with video, screens, technology, and it's basically like an extension of themselves more so than, than the previous generation that came before them. And it's only gonna go there. I mean, technology breaks down barriers, blockchain is coming, that's gonna be gigantic because now that's gonna disrupt everything. And people are gonna to want to be able to have greater access to more things and not worry about the, the process on how to get there. Ergo, if you're talking about getting work done online and having not having to worry about being able to get everyone on this in this uh, in the same room outside of being online, it just seems like it's going there. And that's that. Th those are all small little like things that that would lead me to believe that sure you can do it in person. And you're right, is it a, a completely different experience when you're doing it in person? You have so many different dynamics, a lot more face-to-face -face and, and nonverbal communication. And it's, it's a wonderful thing when you come together and you have that feeling that you, that you did something great. I'm all for that. But for me, I just know that when it comes to business, when it comes to market demand, and when it comes to how this plays out, irregardless of the design sprint process, but getting work done in, a, in an international format with disparate teams across the globe, this is going to be the platform that's going to be in. Maybe it won't be the design sprint. Maybe it will. Maybe it'll be a variation or a hybrid. But you, I felt, and I'm trying to encourage people to start doing your reps now. Start doing this now so that you have, you have the knowledge and the understanding of what this environment is like, what it takes to get, bring people up and teach them so that when the next big thing comes around and it starts catching fire in some ways that relies to what you know, you're going to be one step ahead of the game. And... I, I try to encourage people to have some virtual experience. These LDJs I'm doing, not doing for my health. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, I've done what now six this week. We're going to do three more before the end of the week and probably five more. And we're going to bring, bring people in that are participants to actually facilitate these things outside of me and Sandy. That's the whole point is that we're trying to teach people how to kind of work in this environment because I want to prepare them for what's to come. And if you, I, I know that you're in the midst of, of doing a lot of education and showing that remote has some inherent advantages in terms of cost, in terms of getting people together. And it's also much more convenient, but it's a different animal than regular sprints. Yeah, it, it's, it's just something that you and I agree on. I think just the, the execution is, is different because you're in the business of, of, of meeting client uh, needs. And I'm in the business now of doing education and events and kind of you know, teaching and preaching at the same time showing that it can be done. Oh, it, it, totally. And I, I, I like everything that you just said. Um, it, it's very similar to getting on TikTok right now. <laughs> you know, you, you have to get in early, you have to understand it, you have to build up the reps. And then when it starts to make sense, and th this, this is the kind of the, the bets that we play, uh, the, the, that you've had enough reps, you, you, you can now do it and, and with confidence and, and people buy confidence. That the, the reason I've done, you know, over 40 in-person design sprints and only a couple of remote design sprints or virtual sprints 
is because I'm listening to my customers and they're saying, we need people in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to kind of get everyone together and, and do it. And they, they actually appreciate not doing it at their office. They appreciate doing it at ours because it feels like an away day. They can think and they don't get pulled into their meetings that they're trying to avoid. And if anything, certainly in the past year, uh, remote has been my research sub subject. I, I've been learning it. I've been doing it on myself. I've been, you know, getting to, to get the answers to the questions that I know I'm going to have and, yes. and, and build that up. I think, I think part of this game is though leading as well and, and showing how it can, and it can work. And certainly the companies that, that I work with, they're, they are not yet looking at moving a lot of their business remote or, or virtual or distributed. Um, so for me, as a business unit owner, I need to make new relationships with new customers. Um, and some, somewhere in the future, the current customers will, will get there. I just know they will. Offices are expensive. People's lives are important. It's more inclusive. Uh, you know, the, the reason we started broadcasting our uh, in-person meetups was because our event space is down some stairs. I have no way of encouraging accessibility or ramps or, or anything, and not everyone can get to London. And so I started broadcasting it. And those were the kind of germs of, of the idea of actually just going whole hog. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's... That's what I say to that. I don't want to preach more because I know your audience are already interested in it. The, the one thing I will add is that I heard another sprint facilitator in the world today say that remote sprints are getting popular. So I don't know whether that's an interest from facilitators. I don't know whether that's an interest from potential teams and clients. But when I hear things like that, uh, without prompting it, then I know that things are going to start moving that way. One more data point I can add to that mix. I have now heard from three different, uh, so I will say the one of them, I can't say that, I can't do that. So I've heard from three different people that are in the business of digital communication and uh, whiteboarding and kind of doing abstract kind of design. Uh, I, since I'd say, what are we now? We're in October. Sometime in September, around the beginning of September, there was this huge spike, gigantic spike in interest around uh, remote workshops, design thinking, design workshops. And it came from a combination of tech and pharmaceuticals. For some mm -hmm. reason, those two industries had had an uptick in this space, but how that translated, nobody was talking about. They just said, all of a sudden, one week in September, it was like the second or third week in September, they said um, strategy and marketing came in for a meeting and they were, they, were, they were told to clear their calendars and spend all day with leadership on some client calls that came in. Um, so what that could portend to the future, who knows? But uh, I, my hope it would be is that 2020 starts to see more progress in, in those areas that we're both kind of interested in and just seeing where that kind of, kind of leads us. Um, yeah. But we're, we're way over time. Um, I appreciate you staying after, especially with the- uh, Yeah, I've got five or 10 minutes. I've got something at uh, the bottom of the hour. Um, so yeah, and any final closing or, or anything is, is all good. All right, so we'll, say, we'll, we'll give like a 60 second round off. If anyone who's, down in the chat as well as in zoom wants to ask uh ross any more questions beyond what i'm peppering with at the moment then <laughs> feel free to put that in there um i think in, in the in the absence of that what i'd like to do is uh say a few names in our industry and have you give a your reaction to them in terms Ooh, of this is a fun game yeah okay so i, I might like, know who they are <laughs> i'd like to start with jay malone mm. so Jay and I saw each other, but didn't talk to each other last year at the Google Sprint Conference. This year we did, and I'm going to have more conversations with him. I, I really like what he's doing, and uh, he's, he's, he's a really nice 
person from from the the few minutes that I've spent with him. Um, so more time with Jay soon. Uh, did you get the chance to meet uh, Amir Arab at the yes. conference? Okay, so that's a name, Amir Arab. Uh, I really like this dude. Uh, when he was uh, in Turkey, or is well, where where he was, I yeah. gifted him. Yeah, I gifted him a um, design sprint book signed by Jake Knapp because they have a different cover on the book over there. And um, yeah, I really enjoy spending time with him. He's he's always there. He's always smiling, and he's always giving me a high five. Character on feet. He basically is somebody. It seems like he has just giant character. In my impression, of him. I, I, I feel like he he's probably got a past life that he can't talk about, and that's made oh, him no, part of the talk person. About it. Just give him the plan. <laughs> he'll talk about it. <laughs> and I know he likes to rock. So if he's yeah. if he's in my rock group, then I know he's bringing the party. He was inspiration for metal mockups, actually. Like the idea that you can oh. do animation while basically listening to like Slipatura or like Slipknot or something, and just going. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, Steph Cruchon. Steph Cruchon, uh, he he has been doing this longer than than most people, and uh, like like Xander would say, um, he is a true disciple of uh, Jake Knapp Sprint. Uh, yeah, I, I like spending time with him. He, he's, he's got some really interesting points of view and he's had many reps of this. Um, so he is someone to listen to and respect. Uh, Jonathan Courtney. Jonathan, I saw at the uh, workshop that Jake Knapp and Adrian Smart did in Copenhagen. It was very cold. Uh, after the workshop, we went and got some food and beers. He is a party animal. And uh, yeah, I, I, I got a lot from that workshop. Um, and I, I don't know what he's doing now, like really what he's doing now. I, okay. I, well, he's, he's got a family now, so I'm assuming he's, he's kind of like, a, I don't think the party lifestyle is going to hold up when he's got, he's got his family started. No, I, so I, I'm interested to see what happens next. Um, I mean, it's hard answering all these questions. I don't actually spend a lot of time in the community, which um, <laughs> I probably should, because then I'd have I better answers. Observation and say, well, how about LeBron James? <laughs> yeah, I, I hear he's in some kind of sport thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, we don't have any more questions come up, so I think we'll end it. <laughs> Uh, so for people that want to know more about you and your company and what you're up to, um, I know that, and I've got a little bit of a cheat sheet right here that I can, I can help you out with. Uh, yeah. Your website is etchsprints.com. People yeah. can find you on Twitter as Ross Chapman, all one word. Uh, mm -hmm. You're also on LinkedIn. You have a podcast that you've been doing and you can find it up on Spotify. They'll be in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, any other things that you'd like to kind of put out there for people to know about? Would you like to start any positive rumors that would kind of uh, further your professional brand? Uh, uh, any rumors? Um, yeah, there's, I, I'm not very imaginative. I find it quite hard to invent stuff. I, I like I like kind of solving problems and things. So. Um, yeah, if, if there is a rumor mill, I want you to start it, Robert. I, I, I do have I, two off the top of my head. Okay, you... go for that. So I heard from someone at the Google Design Sprint Conference that in a, in a moment of weakness, you said that you were uh, very much into poetry and that you are going to come out with a, uh, a, a book where it's gonna be all about haikus and they're all gonna be about the design sprint process. And you're not gonna give it a name, you're gonna have a pen name of some type, but you haven't decided on which one you wanna do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, the other is that you're actually not going to, you, you're, you, this, this thing that you mentioned about not necessarily calling it something like a blank sprint, you're actually uh, going to be creating something that's a little bit different than what Steph Crushon's sprint quarter is. And you're creating like something that would actually add three months of time to any particular project if people do certain things as a way of teaching people that if you do these things, you are going to add to your particular uh, like project timeline and to your cost. And you're using that as a marketing tool to showcase how you work faster and better using the design sprint process. That, that probably will actually happen because I, I know I want to continue the momentum and, and to build. 
uh, and yeah, running running a, a, a business team here, uh, that's going to increase billable. So yeah, that's probably definitely true. And uh, finally, you have a 30 to 35 year old fish and chips recipe that comes <laughs> from your family background that you are looking to give away as part of your uh, one, your two year anniversary for Edge Sprints coming up next year. And that will also um, that will also correspond to an event that you'll be doing in house where you'll be serving fish and chips and teaching people about remote design sprints. That, that's incredible. Yeah. And you can actually get a fish and chip hat. It's, it's a bit of a uh, a bit of a secret item, but uh, once you're wearing that, you're you're in you're in the club. Um, so you yeah. just put you just have to put the, the logo on top of that hat, and literally that's, that's going to be a point of entry, and then everyone will be like, "Yeah, you have to have quality fish and chips, though. We're not going to do the, the rubbish where you just basically like." No, it's going to be beer them. batter. Um, there's going to be curry sauce to dip your chips in. Yeah, all of that. You will actually go on a boat somewhere, like you actually like go out and you'll get your fish that you're going to yeah. use fish and chips and then it's going to be quality it's going to be a day out to kind of get to know one another and humanize and learn all about fishing and then mm. you come back have somebody teach you about the best way to do fish and chips and then relax at the end of the day in front of like uh, a roaring fire on one side and plenty of alcohol or adult beverages on one side and it's going to be like a stage or basically you're going to show people how to do note and boat <laughs> that, that i th i think i should make that happen you you've given me so much. Thank I've you. Out your 2020 agenda, man. You, you could just get, you could go home, <laughs> put the slippers on, get the robe, and you're set. You're, you're yeah. Done. Spend time with your family for the rest of the year. You don't have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Robert, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Ross. Uh, you know, I know you got to get ready for some of the bomb of the hour, but thank you so much for coming on this, this program. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I encourage everyone to check out Ross's work online. You can do a search for Ross Chapman. He's on Instagram. He's on Twitter. He's, he's doing a podcast. He's active. Really do check out his work. Uh, I, 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 I do um, uh, really appreciate the, the kind of stuff you're, you're giving to the back to the community, especially in the design sprint community. And it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. And there will be much more. Uh, so yeah, keep them peeled. I'm going to hold you to that. After what I just said, I'm going to hold yeah. you to that. Next you, two weeks. Part, the bar's been set with fish and chips all the way out here. Somewhere in that medium between now and there, you got to find something to kind of work with. It, there's going to be a merch gun with kind of fish and chips. That, that's that's how it's going to be. I sense a logo and a and a photo and a Photoshop <laughs> thing in the future. Anyway, uh, take care. Awesome. Ross. Thank you, you. Everyone for coming on and, and listening, and we'll see you all later. Okay. Bye. Bye.